this uh, scripture passage here in Daniel chapter 5. So at least you learned one thing uh, in the sermon this morning. Uh, But friends, it's great to get to be with you. My name is Charlie Dunn, and if you have been with us for the last uh, several weeks, you know that we are nearing the end of a teaching series that we've been doing in the Old Testament uh, book of Daniel, uh, a series with the title, Work as Worship. And we've been asking the question, how can we uh, approach the work that we do every single day, whether that might be paid work or unpaid work, whether you are retired or you're caring for children, you're working from home or you're working in an office, whatever work it is that you do every day, how can you approach that work as though it were worship? And and, and that's something that we've tried to look at uh, from a number of different angles of how do we bring our faith into the workplace? How do we connect our faith with our work? Uh, But, you know, sadly... Um, Sadly, I think for many people in our culture, um, whether they're Christians or not, when they think about what does it mean for a Christian to bring their faith into the workplace, I think for a lot of people, it it brings to mind somebody like an Angela Martin. Uh, Maybe some of you have seen the TV show The Office before. And therefore, you're familiar with this character, character, maybe more like a caricature uh, of a Christian in the workplace. So here's Angela, and Angela is a very religious person. She really wears that on her sleeve. She often will talk about God. She often will uh, be very critical of everything in the secular culture. Uh, she's somebody who comes across as very judgmental towards her coworkers. And as we find out, she actually herself is a hypocrite because she is not practicing the morals that she would exhort upon others. And I think almost instinctively, if you watch a TV show like The Office and you are a follower of Jesus, almost instinctively, you're going to look at somebody like Angela and you're going to think that is not the kind of Christian co-worker that I want to be. I don't want to be obnoxious about my faith in the workplace. I don't want to be somebody like an Angela Martin. So you know what we end up doing is we jump on the pendulum. And we end up riding the pendulum all the way over to this place where we say, you know, in the way that I share my faith in the workplace, I'm going to be nuanced. I'm going to be relational. I'm going to be subtle. In fact, we might become so subtle that it's virtually imperceptible that we are a Christian at all. Our coworkers, they might look at us and they might say, well, yeah, they're very kind, they they do good work, they are encouraging in the way that they relate with other coworkers, and yet they would have no idea that that's what's motivating that kindness in the way that you relate is your Christian faith because you never mention it. They, They don't know that you actually are a follower of Jesus. And of course, that's very unfortunate, isn't it? Because I think for many of us, especially if you have followed Jesus for a number of years, I think for many of us, the very context in which we may find ourselves most often surrounded by people who don't share our faith, people who have a very different way of looking at the world than we might as followers of Jesus, the context where we're most often around people who are not followers of Jesus might be when we're doing our work, might be in our workplace setting, and perhaps might it be that God has put you in that space. He has put those co-workers around you because he wants to use you to be part of his means of leading those people into his kingdom. Now, to be fair, let me be really clear about this. Evangelism or witness is not the primary reason to go to work. It's not the primary reason why we do our work. We've said this all throughout this sermon series that long before sin ever entered into the world, long before evangelism was even necessary, before people's relationship with God was broken, God created work. Work is a good thing. It's meant to bring meaning and purpose into our lives. We said the work itself can be an act of worship in the way that we do it, in a way that actually reflects God, God who himself is a working God, how our work can reflect his character back to him. God takes delight in that. The way that our work can be the means that God uses to dispense his common grace, blessings within the world. 
the way that our work itself can actually offer a little foretaste of what the future kingdom of God will be like when God restores everything broken in our world. The work itself has value and is a way to worship God. And yet, among the ways that we can worship God through our work, certainly witness is among them. The opportunity that our work can provide to be able to share the hope of Jesus with the people alongside whom we are doing that work. And so that's what I want to talk about together this morning. How can we be effective witnesses in the workplace? And in order to answer that question, I want to look at this story in Daniel 5 that Emily read for us, and I want to suggest that if you want to be an effective witness in the workplace, that there are two perspectives that we need to embrace And then there are two practices that we need to employ. There are two perspectives that we need to embrace. If you even want to be motivated, if you even want to be somebody who wants to share your faith with your coworkers, two perspectives we need to embrace. And then if we want to do that effectively, there are two practices we need to employ. So let's look at those uh, four together. So first, what are the perspectives that we need to embrace? Um, First and foremost... We need to remember that we have, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a tremendous hope to be able to share with the world. You have a tremendous hope to share with your coworkers who don't yet know Jesus, many of whom are essentially feasting on the edge of death. Think about it. Why is it that this king, this Babylonian king Belshazzar, why does he throw this blowout feast where he invites a thousand of the nobles in his kingdom. We're told that he actually brings his wives and his concubines into the feast. That would never have been done. I'll leave it to you to figure out why he might be doing that. He brings out these gold and silver um, vessels, drinking vessels that they had taken when they conquered the temple and destroyed the city of Jerusalem that they took from the Jewish people and they, they drink from them. And they toast the gods together. Why is he throwing this blowout, extravagant sort of feast? And in order to answer that, you need to know a little bit of Babylonian history. So, you know, just a week before this feast took place, um, the the Medo-Persian army, um, led by Darius the Mede, also known as Cyrus, they, they, they fought a decisive battle with the Babylonian army. And they defeated the Babylonian army so that now they are just 50 miles outside of the capital city of Babylon. There's nothing that stands between them and the Babylonians. So you can imagine the people in the city of Babylon are terrified. They are so frightened. What is this invading army going to do? Are they utterly going to destroy us? Are we about to lose our very lives? That's what motivates them to throw this blowout feast. It's a little bit like if you've heard that Dylan Thomas poem before, rage, rage against the dying of the light. When you know that death is coming for you, you you say, you know what, I'm going to go down swinging. And when he said rage, I don't think he meant throw a rager kind of of party, but that's their response. That's what they do. They say, we're just going to throw this blowout feast. It's a little bit like a last meal on death row. Right? You might as well have the best meal that you can have because your life may be about to end. They are feasting on the edge of death. And, and, and friends, do you realize that that is the spiritual situation that so many of our coworkers are in? Uh, coworkers who do not know the hope of Jesus feasting on the edge of death. Because, you know, increasingly in our culture today, if you adopt um, this kind of prevalent secular view of the world, this view of the world that says, you know, why are we here? I don't know. You know, we're here by accident. We're not sure there's a God who created us, who designed us, who gives purpose and direction for our lives. And, you know, when we die, that's it just cease to exist. You just rot in the ground and eventually the sun is going to go out so that all that's left are just oceans of time before and after. Nobody will be left to remember anything that we ever do. If that's your perspective, 
If that's your view of reality, don't you realize that means that the work that we do every day, all the work that we do, that we treat as if it's so important, right? It's so meaningful. We got to meet this deadline. We got to get this done. It's so important that we accomplish this in this way. It's utterly meaningless. All of the things that we care about, all the things that we chase after, all the things that we treat as if they are so important, even all the times that we look at this broken world and we say, that is so wrong, that is so tragic. How can we say that? On what basis can we say that there's something broken, that there's something wrong with our world if in the end everything's just going to burn up anyway and you and I are just going to die and cease to exist? In the end, all of it is meaningless. It's empty. And, and, And many people in our workplaces, that may be their professed view of the world. And yet, of course, nobody can live that way, can we? And if we constantly went around reminding ourselves that when I die, I'm going to cease to exist, everything I do in life is utterly meaningless, nobody could live that way. And so what we do is we make up, we manufacture these ways to try to find meaning in our lives. And maybe it's through pleasure. Maybe it's through feasting and through partying, as the Babylonians are doing here, and we try to find meaning in our experiences. Maybe it's through our gold and our silver, literally the money that we accumulate. Or we try to find meaning and and significance, not just in the money, but actually, you know, these cups, they were not so much um, gold and silver just for their own value. These were trophies. These were ways for the Babylonians to remind themselves that we are superior to the Jewish people whom we conquered. It's essentially racism, right? It's It's the pride of racism that's giving them a sense of their own significance. But we look for that significance in a number of different ways through feeling superior to other people. Uh, or we toast the gods and we worship gods of, of power and money and comfort and beauty, gods that in the end cannot satisfy us, they cannot save us. Feasting on the edge of death. You know, I was reminded this week of what an empty, what a hopeless place it is to go through life without knowing the living God. I got a call from a a young man who, uh, I knew him at one point when he was in high school. He was a part of our uh, high school Bible study that I led for a short period of time. And and now he's close to 30 years old, but he reached out because he said, you know, I'm at a bit of a crisis in life. And, And I thought maybe I could use some spiritual perspective. I haven't gone to church in a long time. I haven't thought about God in a long time. But then he started telling me his story. He said, you know, when I went off to college and then in the years after, he said, uh, I, I, was, I was a pretty big partier. I, I would drink a ton. I would, I would party a lot. I would drink way too much because I thought if I could be the life of the party, then I would feel like I was somebody because people would like me and they would think, man, this guy's so fun to be around. He said, but then I met this girl. And she was amazing. She was awesome. And I started to think to myself, wow, if this girl really likes me, if this girl really cares about me, she's worth changing for. And she asked me to give up drinking, and so I did. And I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was really proud of him um, for sharing that. And he actually ended up um, giving up um, the the drinking to excess that he'd been doing before in in order to be in this relationship. And, and, And yet he said, you know, it's a good relationship, but it's not perfect. And he said, a couple of years ago, I started thinking to myself, you know, maybe what I need to sort of fill that, that emptiness in me, maybe I need to change jobs. So he, he decided to go to law school and he became a lawyer. And he said, you know, part of that was because I wanted to help other people. But he said, honestly, if, if I'm being honest with you, part of it was because I thought if I'm in a respectable sort of profession, then I'll feel significant. Then I'll feel like I'm somebody who really matters. And he said, I still have this emptiness. I've gone from one thing to the next, and there's still this emptiness, and there's still this guilt. He said, I've done some things over the last few years that I'm not very proud of. He shared those with me. He said, I feel guilty about them. He said, my therapist tells me I need to to let go of that guilt. He said, my girlfriend tells me I need to let go of that guilt. I can't shake that guilt. What do I do? And you know what I said to him is I said, "It, it sounds like For for these last several years, you have been worshiping counterfeit gods. You know, Tim Keller wrote a great book with that title. But you've been worshiping counterfeit gods. You know, these good things like the approval of other people, romance, uh, career, these are all good things. But when you worship them, 
when you look to them to be able to give your life that meaning and significance that you seek, they're not able to do so. They're not able to satisfy you. You were built for nothing less than a relationship with the living God. It's his love. It's his approval that you were made for. And I said, as far as that guilt goes, from what you're sharing with me, it sounds like that guilt is a good thing. You you should feel guilty about those things. That's why you have a conscience. And, And yet... And yet you don't have to hold on to that guilt. Because, you know, 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for all of your sins. And when you trust in him, all of that can be forgiven. You can be freed from your guilt. You can find a meaning and a purpose for your life right now and a meaning and purpose that not even death is able to snatch away. Friends, do you realize you have a tremendous hope to be able to share with your coworkers, maybe who are chasing after their life in, in empty places, in gods that cannot save or satisfy. And, and just to be encouraged, you know, Barna did some research, a Christian polling group, they found that among uh, people who are non-Christians who had a spiritual conversation with a Christian in the last year, they said 80% of them had a positive experience. We're also afraid it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be this terrible, awful thing. Well, I'll never want to have a spiritual conversation again. That's not true to people's experience because God put eternity in our hearts. There's part of us that longs to know, is there meaning? Is there purpose? And if you want to be an effective witness, that's the first perspective you've got to have to to embrace that you do have tremendous hope to share with your coworkers. Here's the second perspective you need. Second perspective you need is to know that the praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. The praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. Think about what that means. Now that's, that's, a, that's a phrase from the second book in the Lord of the Rings. Any Lord of the Rings fans? That's a quote from Faramir to a guy named Sam. He says, the praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. Think about that. And you see, Daniel, Daniel was somebody who knew that, didn't he? Daniel knew that so long as I have the approval of the king of the universe, that if the most praiseworthy person who exists delights in me, that is the highest reward I could possibly have. And you see, that's why Daniel, whenever he goes to work, remember what was his job? He was working for the Babylonian government. He was working for the good of his Babylonian neighbors. But whenever Daniel would go into work, whether he was in a position of a lot of influence, remember earlier in the story, he's he's one of the top leaders in the kingdom. Here he seems to be kind of relegated to the sidelines. He's not given as much influence in his workplace. Doesn't matter for him. When he goes into work, Daniel is not going in to meet with his boss, King Belshazzar. He's not going in to flatter him. He's not going in for his own self-promotion. He's not chasing after what kinds of workplace rewards could this guy be able to give to me. Now, what does he say to King Belshazzar? This is verse 17. He says, you may keep your gifts for yourself. And give your rewards to someone else. Remember the king said, you will be made third highest in the whole kingdom if you can interpret the writing. Now maybe Daniel knew that was a little bit empty given the fact that they're about to be you know, conquered and destroyed. Who wants to be head of a kingdom that's going to be destroyed? But I think Daniel understands, and Daniel is somebody who is working for better rewards. And here's the thing, friends. You and I, we're never going to open our mouths. We're never going to have the courage to identify with Jesus, to let our coworkers know that we are Christians, sometimes to be able to speak into situations from God's perspective, to be willing to take that, that risk of, of sharing about Jesus with one of our coworkers, to offer to pray for them, as I know some of you have, have done in the workplace before. We're never going to be willing to do that so long as we are utterly terrified that to do so might cost us some of our reputation, that we might be passed over for a promotion, that we might not be viewed as positively within our organization. God forbid that we might even lose our job for being accused of proselytizing in the workplace. We'll never be willing to open our mouths and to witness 
until we get to that place of knowing that the praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. Unless you go into work the next time you do, recognizing that you already have, if you're a Christian, the approval, the praise of the only one in the universe whose approval really matters. That if you trust in Jesus, God now delights in you. He honors you the very same way that he delights in his eternal son, Jesus. If you can get that squared away in your heart, if you're operating from that assurance that you have that praise and that approval, um, then you'll be somebody who's willing to take the risk of, of witnessing in your workplace. So two perspectives we need to embrace, but then two practices we need to employ. Like, how do we actually go about witnessing in an effective way? And let me just suggest two practices to you we see in this story. Here's the first one. You gotta be willing to publicly identify yourself with Jesus. In other words, do your coworkers know that you're a Christian? Just think about this story. Why is it that when King Belshazzar is perplexed, He's got a problem. He's got an issue that he cannot make sense of in his life from his current wisdom. He can't make sense of it from the wisdom of, of, of all the different you know, news channel pundits, CNN, Fox News, uh, scientists, scholars, whoever else it might be. Nobody can make sense of life really for him from their wisdom, and he needs a different perspective to make sense of his problem, right? Right? And why is it that his, his mother, the queen mother, why does she know to call Daniel? Why does she think, you know, Daniel's somebody who might be able to bring some different perspective, a spiritual perspective into this situation? The reason why we see this all throughout the book of Daniel is because Daniel so clearly is a man who's doing his work as a servant of the Most High God, and everybody knows it. Right? He's not obnoxious about it. But he is very clear about the fact that he is serving the most high God. And so they know to call for him. Would anybody know to call for you? Would anybody know to ask you for prayer? Would anybody know to ask you a question if they had a question about God or faith or what do Christians think about this? Do people know that you are a follower of Jesus in your workplace? And he said, well, how would I make that known to them? Now, do, do I wear like a big cross on my neck? Do I wear those cheesy t-shirts like Jesus is my homeboy? When we're in the break room and I see the sink, do I say, what's to stop you from being baptized? Do you awkwardly turn conversations? Somebody talks about the traffic and you say, well, you know, speaking of traffic, if you were to get hit in a car accident, if you were to die, do you know where you would spend your eternity? No. No. Right? We don't do these awkward, cheesy, obnoxious ways of, of sharing our faith. The way that we make it known that we're followers of Jesus is we be comfortable in our own skin. We don't censor our faith when we come to work. You know, I love this. Uh, somebody in our, our church shared on the, on the survey. He said he loves it on Tuesdays when somebody asks him what he's doing that night. Because he gets to say, well, I'm going to my community group. And often they say, well, what's a community group? He says, well, it's awesome. It's a group of, of friends from my church. We get together once a week and we, we just check in with each other and, and we share life and we open up scripture and we try to, to grow to be people who reflect the love and, and humility of Jesus. We bear each other's burdens. We pray for one another. I mean, how many people are desperate for that kind of, of deep community? That's attractive. Or, or, or maybe somebody says, hey, what are you doing this weekend? You say, well, it's Saturday, June 18th, so I'm serving with my church, with Transform Dallas. We're going to be in Hamilton Park doing work to beautify homes in that neighborhood. Actually, it's really cool because it's part of this, this citywide effort that Christians and churches are a part of. I mean, nobody's going to look negatively uh, on the fact that you, as a Christian, are wanting to, to serve your neighbors. I think everybody could say, hey, that's, that's a really cool thing. I wonder why they do that. Or, or somebody says, hey, how, what did you do this weekend? How was your weekend? Maybe you're willing to say, well, it was a great weekend. I did this and this, and, and I went to church. It was wonderful getting to, to be a part of this, this community. We're doing a series actually on, on work as worship. And so I'm actually coming to work really fired up and motivated for the work I'm going to do today because I've been thinking about how can I approach my work as worship. Maybe somebody asks a follow-up question. That's awesome if they do. 
Maybe they just tuck it away in their mind. They say, okay, I know that person's a follower of Jesus. A couple of you are very intentional about this. One lady who leads a team, she has a moment on Mondays where the team always asks the question, what are you grateful for in your life right now? And she uses that as an opportunity sometimes to talk about her faith, how she's grateful to God and, and, and Christian community and Christian friendships. There's another guy who, who has a moment in his uh, team gathering where they talk about what motivates you to come to work. And he's able to share his faith in that pretty natural way. Now, is there a risk that if you identify with Jesus that some of your coworkers might um, be a little bit turned off to you? Maybe they've got some baggage, some negative perceptions of Christians. Absolutely. But what do you do then? You love them, you serve them, you care for them, you try to overcome those negative perceptions. And look, here's the thing. You can never overcome those negative perceptions if they don't know that you're overcoming negative perceptions. Right? They're just going to think this is a really nice person, but if they don't know you're a Christian, you can't overcome those defenses. Are there going to be other people who are going to hold you to a higher standard, and now they're going to expect you to always be encouraging and kind and thoughtful with your coworkers, to always do your work to the best of your ability, to always speak with integrity? Yes, they're going to hold you to a higher standard, but that's a good thing. Right? That's the accountability uh, sometimes that we need to remember that we are witnesses for Jesus in the workplace. And, you know, even when you mess up and you fail, that too is an opportunity to model repentance, model humility, to go to your coworker and say, look, I really blew it. I'm really sorry. You know, my faith teaches me that I'm a broken, sinful person in need of grace. And I just want to tell you um, that I'm really sorry for, for letting you down in that. Uh, do your coworkers know that you're a follower of Jesus? Are you public with that? And then here's the last thing. The last practice we need to employ is to be willing to then interpret the handwriting on the wall. When those opportunities come, when those situations arise, where maybe a coworker shares something with you about what's going on in their life, maybe where they ask you a question about, hey, what would, would a Christian think about this? Or, hey, hey, would you be willing maybe to, to pray for me? Or where you have an opportunity to speak into something from God's perspective, are you willing to do so? To speak up, to interpret the handwriting on the wall. Now, in Daniel's case, this, this handwriting, it's, it's, it's pretty bleak, right? It's, it's kind of a doom and gloom sort of message, Many, many tackle Parson. What does that mean? He says, it means your days are numbered. You've been weighed on the scales and found wanting, and your kingdom will be divided. Right? Who wants to share that message? You say, I want to share the good news. I don't want to share the, the, the bad news of God's judgment to my coworkers. But, but friends, you've got to recognize often the message of Jesus is bad news before it's good news, isn't it? Isn't that what Daniel is saying as he refers back to what happened with King Nebuchadnezzar? Remember that story from last week? It was only when Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. And it was only when he was willing to admit his pride. Only when he was willing to confess that he had been a cosmic plagiarist. That he'd been trying to take credit for all the good things in his life. He'd been trying to be his own God. It was only when he saw that need that he was then able to receive God's grace. The gospel is often bad news because it offends our pride. It forces us to admit our need as broken sinners before we can receive God's grace. But you know, even in the way that you share that message of God's judgment, you, you, you can do so. Maybe in a way where you're sharing from your own story, from your own experience, where you're not standing in judgment over others, but you share with them, what did God use in your life to humble you? What has he used to get your attention, to show you your need, to help you see that your days are numbered? To recognize that you've been weighed in the scales of God's judgment and that you were found wanting that you had nothing to commend yourself before God, that it was not worth living for your own kingdom that would be taken away from you. How did God humble you? And maybe you can share from that perspective. And then certainly you can share about his grace and how you found forgiveness, freedom from guilt, how you found hope in the midst of suffering, 
how you've stopped having to prove yourself and to perform, knowing that you are enough in Jesus, but are you willing to share? And, and look, you might not get to give your whole testimony in those moments. In fact, if you do, you'll probably never get to, to talk to that coworker about Jesus again. These are short moments. Maybe it's two minutes. You're just sharing something brief from your life, but from God's perspective. And over time, God uses those various conversations to lead somebody to faith in him. But the question is, are we willing to interpret the handwriting on the wall? Are we willing to speak from God's perspective in those opportunities to do so? And it takes time, it takes practice, it takes patience. But I pray that God would use us as a people um, to be his witnesses in whatever work context he has placed us. And you know, somebody um, who's here with us this morning, who I think um, does this really intentionally, um, really wisely and really patiently, uh, I, I wanna invite him to go ahead and, and come on up here this morning. And I'm just gonna ask him a couple of questions because I think um, that he can be a great model, a great example um, for how he seeks to witness in his workplace. And if you're joining us on the live stream, we're gonna go ahead and cut off uh, the live stream right now because um, of, of the sake of his security and the sake of his family's security as they, they serve God in North Africa. Um, but I just wanna ask uh, Kevin uh, a couple of questions. And some of you know Kevin Clay and you know his wife, Michelle.